Good afternoon and welcome to the NCUA webinar on recent changes to the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HMDA, and other consumer compliance laws. My name is Joe Goldberg. I'm the Director of the Division of Consumer Compliance Policy and Outreach in the NCUA's Office of Consumer Financial Protection. My division works on policy issues related to standard consumer protection matters and also conducts the agency's fair lending program, which includes supervision for compliance with HMDA. As you may be aware, this year brought many changes to fair lending and consumer compliance laws. We are presenting this webinar to provide an update on the most significant ones. We will first cover the changes Congress made earlier this year to HMDA reporting. The presenters will also discuss some observations by field staff during their limited HMDA reviews in 2018. In the second half, we will discuss many of the amendments to consumer compliance laws resulting from congressional action in May of 2018. If time permits, we will answer questions you submit during the webinar. Our goal today is to provide you with information and resources you can use to ensure your credit union remains in compliance with all applicable consumer compliance laws and regulations. And now I will turn it over to Grace Lee, who is the moderator and one of the presenters of today's webinar. Thank you, Joe. I'm Grace Lee, Consumer Compliance Policy and Outreach Specialist. Today's webinar is on the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, also known as HMDA, as implemented by Regulation C and the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. We hope to provide helpful information about these important topics. Before we get into the substance of today's webinar, I have a few administrative announcements related to the webcast functionality. First, please make sure the volume on your computer is turned up so that you can hear the webcast. If you have trouble viewing a slide, click on the Enlarge Slides button on the bottom of the console. Please allow pop-ups from the website. A screen resolution of 1024 by 768 or higher will let you see the slides. You can submit a question at any time during the webcast in the Ask a Question box. We have set aside time at the end of today's presentation to address questions as time permits, mostly focusing on questions we received in advance. Thanks to all of you who sent in questions. If your question is not answered during the webcast, please email us at ocfpccpomail at ncua.gov. That's ocfpccpomail at ncua.gov. This webinar will be archived in approximately three weeks after the live event. Please note that we're presenting this webinar for informational purposes only to enhance understanding of the statutes and regulations and CUA administers. The next thing we will see is the agenda on slide two. In the HMDA portion of the webinar, we will cover changes to HMDA data collection and reporting effective January 1, 2018, and the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection, or the Bureau, interpretive and procedural rule issued on August 31, 2018, to clarify changes made in the Economic Growth, Regulatory Relief, and Consumer Protection Act. In the legislative update portion of the webinar, we cover the 2018 changes to various consumer financial protection laws. Now, Matt Nixon, Program Officer, with the Office of Consumer Financial Protections Division of Consumer Compliance Policy and Outreach, will discuss the HMDA portion of the webinar. Thank you, Grace. In this portion of the webinar, I'll be covering changes made to HMDA and Regulation C data collection and reporting requirements made by the Dodd-Frank Act and the Bureau, changes to HMDA data collection and reporting effective January 1st, 2018, the Bureau's interpretive and procedural rule issued on August 31st, 2018, to clarify changes made by the Economic Growth, Regulatory Relief, and Consumer Protection Act, 
recent changes to HMDA and Regulation C regarding exemptions allowed for collection and reporting of certain new data points, and NCUA's ongoing effort to review and test HMDA data reporting in credit unions. But before we dive into these topics, I'll give a brief overview of HMDA and its implementing regulation, Regulation C. The Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HMDA, requires certain financial institutions to collect, report, and disclose information about their mortgage lending activity. HMDA was originally enacted by the Congress in 1975. One statutory purpose of HMDA is to provide the public with information that will help show whether financial institutions are serving the housing credit needs of the communities and neighborhoods in which they are located. A second statutory purpose is to aid public officials in distributing public sector investment so as to attract private investment to areas where it is needed. The Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act of 1989, FIREA, amended HMDA to require the collection and disclosure of data about applicant and borrower characteristics, assist in identifying possible discriminatory lending patterns, and help enforce anti-discrimination statutes. Regulation C implements HMDA. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, or the Dodd-Frank Act, amended HMDA to, among other things, require reporting of additional data points, transfer HMDA rulemaking authority from the Federal Reserve Board to the Bureau, and transfer Regulation C rulemaking authority to the Bureau. In August 2014, the Bureau proposed amendments to Regulation C to implement the Dodd-Frank Act changes to require collection, recording, and reporting of additional information to further HMDA's purposes and to modernize the manner in which covered institutions report HMDA data. The Bureau published final amendments to Regulation C in October 2015. Under that rule, financial institutions continue to report data regarding loan originations, applications, and loan purchases. The Bureau's rule changed the types of financial institutions subject to Regulation C, the types of transactions subject to Regulation C, the data financial institutions are required to collect, record, and report pursuant to Regulation C, and the processes for reporting and disclosing HMDA data. Data is now submitted electronically to the Bureau on behalf of the appropriate federal agency associated with the reporter, and much of the data are made available to the public on both an aggregate and a loan level basis. The next slide outlines the loan volume thresholds effective January 1, 2018. The loan volume thresholds require an institution originating at least 25 closed-in mortgages or at least 500 opened-in lines of credit in each of the two preceding calendar years to report HMDA data. This is the case if the institution meets all of the other criteria for institutional coverage, which I'll cover at the end of this slide. The 500 opened-in line of credit threshold is temporary and applies in calendar years 2018 and 2019. Effective January 1, 2020, the opened-in lines of credit threshold reverts to 100 in each of the two preceding calendar years, the threshold stated in the 2015 final rule. The other institutional coverage criteria do not change in 2020. Thus, effective January 1, 2020, a depository financial institution is subject to Regulation C 
if it originated at least 25 covered closed-in mortgage loans in each of the preceding two calendar years, or at least 100 covered opened-in lines of credit in each of the two preceding calendar years, and meets the other applicable coverage criteria. The 2015 rule also included a separate test to exclude institutions that offer opened-in lines of credit and no closed-in mortgage loans from institutional coverage. In other words, institutions that only offer HELOCs are not required to report, even if they originate more than 500 HELOCs annually, because an institution still must originate at least one home purchase loan or refinancing of a home purchase loan secured by a first lien on a one to four unit dwelling in order to be a covered institution. The other coverage criteria includes having a home or branch office in a metropolitan statistical area as of the prior December 31st and meeting the applicable total asset threshold as of the prior December 31st. Currently, the asset threshold is 45 million. Let's look at some examples to help understand this. This slide provides HMDA institutional coverage threshold examples. As mentioned on the previous slide, Credit unions do not have to collect and report HMDA data for closed-in mortgage loans for the current reporting year if they did not originate at least 25 closed-in mortgage loans in each of the prior two years. And credit unions do not have to collect and report HMDA data for opened-in lines of credit in the current reporting year if they did not originate at least 500 opened-in lines of credit in each of the prior two years. In example A, the credit union must only report opened-in lines of credit because the credit union originated at least 500 opened-in lines of credit in each of the prior two years, but did not originate at least 25 closed-in mortgage loans in each of the prior two years. In example B, only closed-in mortgage loans must be reported. In example C, both closed-in mortgage loans and opened-in lines of credit must be reported. And in example D, the credit union is not required to file a HMDA loan application register. However, the credit union may elect to optionally report since loan volume is near the reporting threshold for both closed-in mortgage loans and opened-in lines of credit. In January 2018, the Bureau modified Regulation C regarding government monitoring information, or GMI. GMI is data collected and reported about the applicants. The changes also affected the types of loans to be reported. Although originators who are not HMDA filers also collect GMI, our discussion is only in the context of HMDA filing. First, I'll discuss new requirements for collection of GMI on ethnicity, race, and sex. The final rule requires financial institutions to report whether ethnicity, race, or sex information was collected on the basis of visual obser observation or surname when an application is taken in person and the applicant does not provide the information. You likely are already familiar with the ethnicity and race categories that I'm referring to in this presentation as aggregated categories. For ethnicity, the aggregated categories are Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino. For race, the aggregated categories are American Indian or Alaskan Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and white. The final rule added four disaggregated ethnicity 
and 12 disaggregated race categories for information provided by applicants. Financial institutions must permit applicants to self-identify using disaggregated ethnic and racial subcategories and must report the disaggregated information applicants provide. For example, the aggregated ethnicity category of Hispanic or Latino must be broken down into the subcategories of Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or other Hispanic or Latino. The aggregated race category of Asian and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander categories also must be broken down into their respective disaggregated subcategories. When race and ethnicity data is completed by the financial institution, the final rule retains the current requirements requiring financial institutions to provide only aggregated ethnic or racial data. The final rule does not require or permit financial institutions to use the disaggregated subcategories when identifying the applicant's ethnicity and race based on visual observation or surname. In the January 2018 revision, the Bureau also includes a new dwelling secured standard for all loans or lines of credit for personal, family, or household purposes. So, most consumer purpose transactions, including closed-in home equity loans, home equity lines of credit, and reverse mortgages are subject to the regulation. Most commercial purpose transactions are subject to the regulation only if they are for the purpose of home purchase, home improvement, or refinancing. The final rule excludes from coverage home improvement loans not secured by a dwelling, that is, unsecured home improvement loans or home improvement loans secured by some other type of collateral, and all agricultural purpose loans and lines of credit. The 2015 HMDA rule significantly changes the data points HMDA filers are required to collect and report for 2018 and thereafter. Prior to the 2018 reporting year, financial institutions were required to collect and report 22 data points and had the option of reporting reasons for denial for a total of 23 data points. The Dodd-Frank Act revised HMDA reporting requirements to align current HMDA fields with industry data standards and close information gaps. The first table shows the data points required in 2017 and prior reporting years. The second table shows the data points added by the Dodd-Frank Act for 2018 and after reporting years. The third table shows the data points added under the Bureau's discretionary authority for 2018 and after reporting years. Note, for 2017 and prior reporting years, reporting of reasons for denial had been optional and reporting of approved but not accepted applications and HELOC applications for home improvement purposes had also been optional. The 2015 HMDA rule required credit unions to collect, record, and report information on a total of 48 data points. There are 25 new data points, 11 new data points identified in the Dodd-Frank Act, and 14 new data points added by the Bureau under their discretionary authority. There are 23 existing data points. The final rule modified 14 existing data points. The final rule left nine data points unchanged and changed reporting of reasons for denial from optional to mandatory and eliminated reporting of metropolitan statistical areas and metropolitan divisions. When reporting reasons for denial, credit unions 
now have the option of reporting four denial reasons instead of three. Credit unions must report all 48 data points on their 2018 Humdalar due March 1, 2019, unless they qualify for a partial exemption. I'll discuss partial exemption requirements later in the presentation. The data points required to be reported under the 2015 final rule are grouped into four broad categories. Information about applicants, borrowers, and the underwriting process, such as age, credit score, debt to income ratio, and automated underwriting system results. Information about the property securing the loan, such as construction method, property value, and additional information about manufactured and multifamily housing. Information about the features of the loan, such as additional pricing information, loan term, interest rate, introductory rate period, non-amortizing features, and the type of loan, and certain unique identifiers, such as a universal loan identifier, property address, loan originator identifier, and a legal entity identifier for the financial institution. The next five slides list all of the HUMDA data points within the four categories. Information about applicants, borrowers, and the underwriting process include the following data points. Applicant ethnicity, race, and sex, applicant age, applicant income, applicant debt to income ratio and credit score, the name of the automated underwriting system used to evaluate the application, if any, the application channel, indicating whether or not the application was submitted to the credit union directly, the reason or reasons for denial, if the application was denied, the application date, and whether the transaction involved a pre-approval request. Information about the property securing the loan includes the following data points. Property location by state, county, and census tract, lien status, value of the property relied on that secures the loan, combined loan to value ratio, whether the dwelling is site built or a manufactured home, if a manufactured home, whether the loan is secured by a manufactured home and land or a manufactured home and not land, information about the applicant's or borrower's ownership or leasehold interest in the land where the manufactured home is located, number of individual, individual dwelling units related to the property, number of individual dwelling units related to the property that are income restricted under federal, state, or local affordable housing programs, and whether the property will be used as a principal residence, second residence, or investment property. <clears throat> this is the first of two slides discussing loan features. Reportable loan features include loan type, that is whether the loan or application is insured by the FHA or guaranteed by the VA, Rural Housing Service, or Farm Service Agency, whether the transaction is for home purchase, home improvement, refinancing, cash out refinancing, or another purpose, the loan amount, action taken and action taken date, type of purchaser, if any, rate spread, the difference between the annual percentage rate and average prime offer rate for a comparable transaction, whether the loan is a high cost mortgage under the Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act, the total loan costs or total points and fees charged, and 
total borrower paid origination charges. Reportable loan features also include points paid to the credit union to reduce the interest rate, amount of lender credits, interest rate on the approved application or loan, term in months of any prepayment penalty, number of months after which the legal obligation will mature or terminate, number of months until the first date the interest rate may change, whether the transaction involves a balloon payment, interest-only interest only payments, negative amortization, or any other type of non-amortizing feature, whether the transaction is for a reverse mortgage, whether the transaction is for an open-end line of credit, and whether the transaction is primarily for a business or com commercial purpose. Finally, some HMDA data points provide identifying information about the application or loan. The legal entity identifier is an identifier issued to the financial institution by a utility endorsed by the Global LEI Foundation or LEI Regulatory Oversight Committee. The universal loan identifier is an identifier assigned to identify and, ret and retrieve a loan or application. The physical address of the property securing the loan and the National Mortgage Licensing System and Registry Identifier for the Mortgage Loan Originator. On May 24, 2018, the President signed the Economic Growth, Regulatory Relief, and Consumer Protection Act into law. It is sometimes referred to by its bill number, S-2155. Section 104A of S-2155 amends Section 304I of HMDA by adding partial exemptions from HMDA's requirements for certain insured credit unions. New HMDA Section 304I-1 added by S-2155, provides that the requirements of HMDA Sections 304B-5 and 6 shall not apply with respect to closed-in mortgage loans of an insured credit union if it originated fewer than 500 closed-in mortgage loans in each of the two preceding calendar years. Similarly, new HMDA Section 304I-2 provides that the requirements of HMDA Section 304B-5 and 6 shall not apply with respect to opened-end lines of credit of an insured credit union if it originated fewer than 500 opened-end lines of credit in each of the two preceding calendar years. The Bureau issued an in interpretive and procedural rule on August 31, 2018, becoming effective September 7, 2018. The rule clarifies and implements changes made to HMDA and Regulation C by S-2155. The interpretive rule clarifies that only closed-in mortgage loans and opened-in lines of credit that are otherwise reportable under Regulation C count toward the thresholds for the partial exemptions named in S-2155. Permits the use of a unique non-universal loan identifier for certain partially exempt transactions and includes parameters on what constitutes an allowable non-universal loan identifier. Clarifies that insured credit unions qualifying for a partial exemption may optionally report exempt data points so long as they report all data fields that the data point comprises. The rule identifies the seven data points that contain multiple data fields and includes a table identifying the 26 data points in Regulation C 
covered by the partial exemptions named in S-2155. NCUA's Office of Consumer Financial Protection issued Consumer Financial Protection Update 18-01, dated September 10, 2018, discussing key provisions of the rule. For purposes of the partial exemptions, the interpretive rule clarifies that closed-end mortgage loan and opened-end line of credit mean only those loans or lines of credit secured by a dwelling that would otherwise be reportable under HMDA. Credit unions may use either a universal loan identifier or non-universal loan identifier for applications and loans qualifying for a partial exemption. A universal loan identifier is defined in HMDA. A non-universal loan identifier may be comprised of up to 22 characters to identify the covered loan or application, which may be letters, numerals, or a combination of letters and numerals, must be unique within the insured depository institution or insured credit union, and must not include any information that could be used to directly identify the applicant or borrower. An insured depository institution or insured credit union has the option to voluntarily report exempt data points for transactions that qualify for a partial exemption. However, an insured depository institution or insured credit union that opts to voluntarily report an exempt data point must report, report all data fields that the specific data point comprises. There are a total of 26 data points covered under the partial exemption. This slide lists the first 13 data points that credit unions do not have to collect and report if the credit union is exempt. The exempt data points are universal loan identifier, property address, rate spread, credit score, mandatorily reported reasons for denial, total loan costs or total points and fees, origination charges, discount points, lender credits, interest rate, prepayment penalty term, debt to income ratio, combined loan to value ratio. The remaining 13 data points which are exempted are loan term, introductory rate period, non-amortizing features, property value, manufactured home secured property type, manufactured home land property interest, multifamily affordable units, application channel, mortgage loan originator identifier, automated underwriting system, reverse mortgage flag, opened in line of credit flag, and business or commercial purpose flag. This slide provides partial exemption examples. As we go through these, keep in mind that credit unions do not have to collect and report the 26 data points subject to the partial exemption for the current reporting year if they did not originate at least 500 closed-in mortgages in each of the prior two years. The same partial exemption applies to opened-in lines of credit if they did not originate at least 500 opened-in lines of credit in each of the prior two years. In example A, the credit union originated at least 500 closed-in mortgage loans and at least 500 opened-in lines of credit in each of the prior two years. The credit union 
does not qualify for a partial exemption for either loan type. It must collect and report all data points, including the 26 data points covered under the partial exemption for both closed-in mortgages and opened-in lines of credit. <clears throat> In example B, the credit union originated at least 500 opened-in lines of credit in each of the prior two years, but did not originate at least 500 closed-in mortgage, mortgage loans in each of the prior two years. The partial exemption applies only to closed-in mortgage loans. The credit union is required to report HUMDA data for closed-in mortgage loans because it originated 25 or more in the two preceding calendar years, but it is exempt from reporting the 26 data points covered under the partial exemption for closed-in mortgage loans. The credit union collects and reports all data points, including the 26 data points covered under the partial exemption for opened-in lines of credit. In example C, both loan types are covered by the partial exemption. The credit union is exempt from reporting the 26 data points covered under the partial exemption for closed-in mortgage loans and opened-in lines of credit. The credit union will report HUMDA data for closed-in mortgage loans because it originated 25 or more in the two preceding calendar years. The credit union is not required to report any data for opened-in lines of credit. However, as a reminder, the Bureau temporarily increased the opened-in lines of credit threshold from 100 to 500 for calendar years 2018 and 2019. If this example were given in 2020, the credit union would still qualify for a partial exemption for opened-in lines of credit but would be required to report all data points not covered by the partial exemption because it originated 100 or more opened-in lines of credit in the two preceding calendar years. In example D, the credit union originated at least 500 closed-in mortgage loans in each of the prior two years but did not originate at least 500 opened-in lines of credit over the same period. The partial exemption applies only to opened-in lines of credit. The credit union collects and reports all data points, including the 26 data points covered under the partial exemption for closed-in mortgage loans. As with example C, the credit union is not required to report any data for opened-in lines of credit, but would report data points not covered by the partial exemption if this example was given in 2020 or later because opened-in lines of credit exceed 100 annually. While this may seem confusing, we have a number of resources to help you understand HUMDA requirements. We provide a list of those resources at the end of this presentation. NCUA examiners are performing limited reviews of 2018 HUMDA loan application register data during on-site exams at federal credit unions this year. Examiners review a sample of 10 applications from the credit union's 2018 HUMDALAR using the testing spreadsheet provided in ARIES and completes the HUMDA ARIES questionnaire. The goal of the limited reviews is to de determine if credit unions are making a good faith effort to comply with new HUMDA rules. We are not citing violations for data collected but not yet filed. Based on HUMDA reviews that were completed in 2018, we believe credit unions are generally making a good faith effort to comply with new requirements. Some common issues we noted include, one, as of the exam dates, 
some vendors had not yet made available platforms to collect new Humda data fields. We believe many have since corrected this, but for the credit unions who rely on third-party vendors to collect, record, or report Humda data, which is the majority of you, you should be working with your vendors now to ensure a smooth 2018 reporting cycle. Two, examiners noted several instances where data was not mapped correctly between loan and Humda platforms. Credit unions should be test checking the accuracy of map data. Three, Regulation C requires financial institutions to record Humda data on a loan application register within 30 calendar days after the end of the calendar quarter in which final action is taken, such as origination or denial. Some credit unions are not complying with Regulation C's quarterly recording requirement. And finally, four, we were unable to conclude anything about the types of individual errors noted other than to say that they seem to be randomly dispersed. Credit unions did not appear to be having difficulty with any particular data field or fields. That concludes my portion of today's webinar. I will now turn it over to Al Brantley to provide a legislative update. Thank you, Matt. I'm Al Brantley, Program Officer in the Office of Consumer Financial Protection, Division of Consumer Compliance Policy and Outreach. Grace and I will now cover the changes S-2155 made to various consumer financial protection laws. The section numbers on the slides refer to the section of S-2155 where the change is found. You should refer to S-2155 itself to see which part of an existing law the section amends. We provide a link to S-2155 in the reference section of the presentation. In addition to HMDA, S-2155 amended several other mortgage rules providing regulatory relief or exemptions for eligible credit unions. We will focus on four sections of S-2155 addressing mortgage rules with consumer compliance implications. The provisions in three of these sections have been in effect since May 24, 2018. One section, however, requires the Bureau to first issue a conforming regulation. This slide lists the topics covered by the four sections. Section 101 amends the Truth in Lending Act to create a new safe harbor category of qualified mortgage or QM loans or, originate or obligations held in portfolio by the originator. This provision is limited to insured depositories, including credit unions, with less than $10 billion in assets. To be eligible, an insured credit union must consider and document a borrower's debts, income, and other financial resources, and the loan must satisfy certain product feature restrictions. Assessment of the borrower's ability to repay the loan is less prescriptive than the small credit or QM option. To qualify for this new safe harbor category, insured credit unions are not required to follow Appendix Q of Regulation Z. This provision allows for multiple methods of documentation of borrower's debts, income, and other resources. The loan must satisfy fewer product feature restrictions compared to the small credit or QM. Applicable requirements include points and fees limits, no negative amortization, no interest only terms, and prepayment penalty limits. Remember, federal credit unions are prohibited from imposing a prepayment penalty. Although the safe harbor is intended to apply to loans held in portfolio, it remains available under limited circumstances if the loan is sold, assigned, or transferred. These circumstances include a transfer resulting from failure or merger of the insured credit union, a transfer to an insured depository institution with less than $10 billion in assets and retained in portfolio by the transferee institution, or a transfer to a wholly owned subsidiary of the insured credit union 
and the loan is considered an asset of the credit union for regulatory accounting purposes. This slide compares the small creditor QM to the Section 101 provisions. Section 101 allows larger credit unions to use the portfolio compliance category. The asset cap of $10 billion as opposed to the $2 billion asset cap for the small creditor QM. This new QM category is available only to insured banks and credit unions, non-depository institutions or lenders are excluded. Notably, the Section 101 Safe Harbor has more restrictive portfolio requirements, requiring credit unions to hold the loan in portfolio, generally for the life of the loan, rather than for just three years. However, the Section 101 Safe Harbor has more relaxed loan criteria. Insured credit unions must comply with some product feature restrictions, but those restrictions are less stringent than under the Small Creditor Portfolio QM category. Additionally, Section 101 relaxes underwriting criteria, requiring credit unions to consider and document a borrower's debts, income, and other financial resources in accordance with less prescriptive guidance than is required under the other QM category. Section 103 amends Title 11 of the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act, or FIREA. FIREA requires NCUA and other federal banking agencies to prescribe appropriate standards for real estate appraisals, covering agency-approved and regulated financial transactions and describing when the services of an appraiser is required. Interagency appraisal and evaluation guidelines were jointly issued on December 2, 2010. NCUA issued a proposed rule on October 3, 2018 to amend the agency's real estate appraisals regulation in conformity with the FARIA amendment and to accomplish a few other objectives. Comments are due by December 3, 2018. The FARIA amendment imposes the transaction value threshold and certain criteria to exempt real estate transactions in rural areas from appraisal requirements. Mortgages under $400,000 may be exempt from appraisal requirements when a licensed or certified appraiser cannot be found in a timely manner. To take advantage of the exemption, the credit union originating the mortgage must contact at least three appraisers from its approved list Document that none of the contacted appraisers is available within five business days beyond reasonable fee and timeliness standards and be subject to oversight by NCUA. Notably, the exemption does not apply to high-cost mortgage loans, also known as HOEPA loans, as defined in the Truth in Lending Act. If a qualifying loan is sold or transferred, the exemption is unavailable except in limited circumstances. Those include a transfer due to failure or merger of the mortgage originator, transfer to another federally regulated entity and retained in portfolio, or transfer to a wholly owned subsidiary and reported as an asset of the mortgage originator. NCUA retains authority to require an appraisal for safety and soundness concerns. A credit union making a mortgage loan without an appraisal may be limited in its ability to sell that obligation. Overall, the Section 103 waiver provision reduces a regulatory hurdle for credit unions in rural areas where state licensed or state certified appraisers are sometimes difficult to find or unable to complete an appraisal in a reasonable amount of time to close on a mortgage. Section 108 amends the Truth in Lending Act and adds new criteria for a consumer credit transaction secured by a principal dwelling to be exempt from escrow requirements. The provisions are not effective until the Bureau issues a conforming regulation. Essentially, the changes establish a broad exemption from some escrow requirements with different criteria than the previous exemption. Under S-2155, credit unions with assets of $10 billion or less that, together with their affiliates, originated 1,000 or fewer first lien mortgages during the preceding calendar year may qualify. 
Under the Bureau's existing escrow rule, exemptions are provided for credit unions that have less than $2 billion in total assets and extend 2,000 or fewer mortgages. Other restrictions also apply. Section 108 imposes three additional requirements for eligibility. The credit union extended a consumer loan secured by a dwelling in a rural or underserved area in the last or previous two years, depending on when in the year the subject loan is made. The credit union generally does not establish and maintain escrow accounts, and at consummation, the loan is not subject to a commitment to be acquired by a person who is ineligible for the same exemption. The Bureau's Fall 2018 rulemaking agenda includes a future rulemaking project to implement the new criteria for exempting mortgage escrow requirements. At this point, however, the Bureau has not indicated when it plans to roll out a proposed rule. By no later than the Spring 2019 agenda, the Bureau expects to issue a more comprehensive statement of its priorities. Under the TRID rule, certain changes to the closing disclosure require a new three-day waiting period before consummation. Any change to a loan product type, the addition of a prepayment penalty, though not allowed by federal credit unions, or if the APR becomes inaccurate as defined by regulation. Section 109 amends the Truth in Lending Act and removes the three-day waiting period required under the TILA RESPA integrated disclosure rule when a creditor extends a second offer of credit secured by real property with a lower annual percentage rate. This provision applies only to high-cost mortgage loans as defined in TILA. Section 109 eliminates the three-day waiting period between a consumer receiving a closing disclosure and closing on the loan if the consumer received a corrected closing disclosure that includes a lower APR than was offered in the previous disclosure. Note that the three-day waiting period is only the one required when a corrected closing disclosure is issued. This does not affect the three-day waiting period for rescission otherwise required by TILA. Again, this waiver provision only applies to high-cost mortgage loans. Now I will yield the mic to Grace, who will discuss specific consumer protection amendments in S-2155. Thank you, Al. Before I proceed, I would like to remind participants that if you have a question you would like to ask us now, please submit them in the Ask a Question box. S-2155 provides consumers and veterans with additional credit protections. Section 303 protects credit unions and certain credit union employees from liability in any civil or administrative proceeding in situations where those employees make a report about the potential exploitation of a senior citizen to a governmental agency so long as the credit union has provided training and the report is made in good faith and with reasonable care. Nothing in this provision limits the liability of an individual or a covered financial institution in a civil action for any act, omission, or fraud that is not a disclosure described in this law. The covered credit union employees include compliance and legal personnel and supervisors, as well as registered representatives, investment advisors, and insurance producers. Covered employees on our credit union employers receive immunity from civil or administrative proceedings for the disclosure. Section 303 also provides guidance regarding the content, timing, and record maintenance requirements of such training. Title VI of S-2155 also provides additional consumer protections related to student loans. Section 601 amends TILA to prohibit financial institutions, including credit unions, from accelerating private student loan debt solely on the basis of bankruptcy or death of a cosigner. The term cosigner is defined to mean any individual who is liable for someone else's obligation without compensation, regardless of how such individual 
is designated in the contract for that obligation. And any person whose signature is requested as a condition of granting credit or forbearing on collection. Please note that the following individuals are not deemed cosigners. One, the spouse of an individual who is deemed a cosigner because he or she is liable for someone else's obligation without compensation if the spouse's signature is needed to perfect the security interest in a loan, and two, an individual who is liable for a private student loan made to consolidate pre-existing student loans. Section 601 provides that the holder of a private education loan must release a cosigner from his or her obligation upon the death of the student obligor and provide notification to the cosigner within a reasonable time of release. Section 601 also requires a lender provide a student borrower with the option to designate to have the legal authority with the option to designate a person to have the legal authority to act on the student's behalf with respect to the loan in case of his or her death. The amendments apply to private education loans entered into on or after November 20th, 2018. Section 602 amends the Fair Credit Reporting Act by allowing a consumer to request that a financial institution remove a reported default on a private education loan from his or her credit report if the financial institution offers and the borrower successfully completes a loan rehabilitation program designed by the institution. The consumer may request the removal of a reported default only once per loan. The Government Accounting Office must also, in consultation with the federal banking regulators, conduct and submit a study to Congress regarding the costs associated with implementing this new provision and the effects of the provision on the accuracy of credit reporting. Title III of S2155 provides specific credit protections to veterans and active military personnel. Section 302 amends FICRA by requiring the exclusion from credit reports of certain medical in a certain medical debt incurred by a veteran. Section 302 defines veterans' medical debt as debt of a veteran owed to a health care provider other than, the, other than the Department of Veterans Affairs, or VA, and submitted to the VA for health care payments authorized by the VA. It includes medical collection debt that the VA has wrongfully charged a veteran. Section 302 prohibits the inclusion of a veteran's medical debt on credit reports for one year after the provision of medical services and also requires that any debt previously characterized as delinquent, charged off, or in collection be removed when the debt has been fully paid or settled. Section 302 requires the VA secretary to create a verification database to allow CRAs to confirm whether a debt furnished to them is a veteran's medical debt and to verify a veteran's medical debt. Section 302 also requires CRAs to provide free electronic credit monitoring to active duty members of the military and members of the National Guard. Sections 309 and 313 provide veterans with protections against foreclosures. Section 309 adds protections for veterans who refinance their purchase or construction home loans. Under Section 309, the VA will not guarantee or ensure the refinancing of a loan to purchase or construct a home unless the insurer provides a certification of the recoupment period for expenses incurred by the borrower in refinancing the loan. Further, all costs and fees must be recouped within 36 months of the loan issuance, and the recoupment must occur through lower monthly payments due to the refinancing. In addition, the insurer must provide the veteran with a net tangible benefit test 
and abide by certain rules regarding the required minimum reduction in the interest rate on the refinanced loan. Section 309 also requires the VA to issue a, re a report on cash out refinances by May 24, 2019. Section 313 makes permanent an amendment to the Service Members Civil Relief Act that allows for a stay of foreclosure, sale, or seizure proceedings for a service member for any action filed during or within one year of the service member's period of service. The effective date of Section 313 was May 24, 2018. Title III of S2155 also provides consumers with credit protections. Section 301 amends FCRA to require CRAs to, one, allow consumers, including minors and incapacitated persons acting through their representatives, to place or remove a security freeze on their credit report free of charge, and two, notify consumers of their right to a security freeze. Section 301 also extends the time for an initial fraud alert from 90 days to one year. Further, the Federal Trade Commission must maintain a central web page linking to each credit bureau's web page for, for requesting a freeze or fraud alert or to opt out of information sharing for marketing purposes. The effective date for Section 301 was September 21, 2018. Section 603 requires the U.S. Treasury Department's Financial Literacy and Education Commission to solicit public comment and obtain input from relevant parties to establish best practices for institutions of higher education, including methods to teach financial literacy skills and to ensure that students are well informed of their total borrowing obligations within one year from the date of enactment. These best practices must include ways to communicate to students the importance of graduating on their ability to repay student loans and methods to ensure that they understand their borrowing obligations. However, institutions of higher education would not be required to adopt these best practices. S2155 also provides additional consumer protections. Because of time constraints, we cannot discuss them all, but we list them on this slide. We recommend that you go to S2155 to review these provisions. The next two slides list Hunda references. The next four slides list some of the references associated with S2155. On October 17, 2018, the Bureau's Fall 2018 Unified Agenda was published. In it, the Bureau addresses which of S2155's provisions do not require Bureau rulemaking to take effect. For examples, Sections 101, 104, 106, 107, 301, and 601. Even though Bureau rulemaking is not required for these provisions to take effect, Bureau has noted in the Unified Agenda that notice and comment rulemaking may be helpful to better implement or clarify these provisions. The Unified Agenda also notes those provisions in S2155 requiring Bureau rulemaking. In today's webinar, we discussed the changes made to HMDA and Regulation C data collection and reporting requirements made by the Dodd-Frank Act and, and the Bureau, as well as the recent changes to HMDA and Regulation C regarding exemptions allowed for collection and reporting of certain data points. 
We also discussed the 2018 changes to various consumer financial protection laws from S2155. Again, if you have any questions you would like to ask us now, please submit them in the Ask a Question box. If you have questions you want to submit to us after the webinar, please feel free to email us at the address provided on this slide. It's now time to answer some of your questions. We'll first go over some of the questions we received prior to today's broadcast. Um, Uh, we received one question about member business loans. Um, specifically, I heard that S2155 made a change to member business loans. Is that right? I'll answer this question. Um, yes. Section 105 of S2155 excludes from the statutory definition of member business loan an extension of credit fully secured by lien on a one to four family dwelling that is not the primary residence of a member. This means that loans for those properties do not count against the cap imposed on each federally insured credit union by the FCU Act. Previously, only loans secured by a one to four family dwelling that is the member's primary residence were excluded. This change was reflected in the NCUA's rules and regulation through a notation vote on May 30th, 2018. We also received a couple of questions about NCUA's 2018 and 2019 Hunza reviews, and I'll ask Matt to answer both of these questions. So the first question, last year, NCUA issued guidance on the new SFIC Uniform Hunza Resubmission Guidelines, which you did not discuss in today's webinar. Are these ex NCUA examiners using these procedures for the 2018 Humda reviews you are performing? Thanks, Grace. Um, yeah, NCUA did issue a letter to credit unions in August 2017. I believe it's letter 17CU04, which addresses Humda resubmission guidelines that we at NCUA and our sister agencies, so that would be the FRB, OCC, FDIC, and BCFP will use when we test HMDA accuracy in, the regula in, in our regulated institutions. We are not using these formal testing procedures for the HMDA reviews that we are completing this year, which are the ones that we discussed in today's webinar. Um, the uh, procedures discussed in letter 17 CU04 require correction and resubmission of a credit union's humdalar when NCUA examiners following formal testing procedures observe error rates that exceed specified thresholds. The uh, reviews discussed in today's webinar are informal Humda reviews. In other words, they're not using statistical sampling tables. And the reviews this year are intended to provide credit unions with constructive feedback before they file their 2018 Humdalars in 2019. However, we do encourage credit unions to familiarize themselves with the letter since the procedures discussed could result in NCUA requiring a credit union to correct and resubmit its Humdalar uh, normally during a fair lending examination. The uh, procedures discussed in that letter are not widely used outside of our fair lending examination program. Thanks, Matt. Uh, the other question had to do, do with whether NCUA examiners are performing Humda reviews uh, in 2019. We are currently in the process of finalizing 2019 examination priorities. 
Humda will likely be included, but I can't say more at this time until we actually finalize the uh, the program and um, definitize all of the uh, all of the issues contained within. Thanks again, Matt. Um, Al, we got a couple of questions about QMs. Uh, the first question is, if a credit union meets all of the Section 101 provisions for QM relief, what does a credit union need to do to determine ability to repay in order to reduce potential liability? Okay. So under the change, and we're talking about Section 101 uh, of S2155, uh, the credit union must consider the borrower's debts, income, and other financial resources. If you recall, back in 2013, the Bureau uh, issued the ability to repay, or ATR, rule. And this, is, this rule implemented the Dodd-Frank Act requirement uh, of, of, of looking at the borrower's uh, ability to repay the loan. Um, so a credit union must still verify, um, well, under that rule, the credit union must verify and document that at the time of the mortgage, when it's made, at the time it's made, the borrower has the ability to repay the loan. So a credit union then can comply with the ATR requirement by originating a qualified mortgage, or QM. Section 101 uh, merely creates a new safe harbor category of QM loans, but allows a multiple or multiple methods of documenting the borrower's ATR. So the ability to repay is still a requirement. Um, so therefore, uh, all QM loans are presumed to have complied with the ATR requirement, thereby reducing the credit union's potential legal liability for its residential mortgage lending activities. Thank you, Al. Uh, the next question asks, our credit union has $8 billion in assets, and we are in the process of acquiring a bank's residential mortgage portfolio through a business combination. Can those loans be treated as QMs? If the bank's mortgage loans meet the Section 101 conditions for QM relief, as we discussed in the presentation, the safe harbor remains available to the acquiring credit union when legal title to a residential mortgage loan is transferred as a result of a merger. Uh, to apply the safe harbor, however, such loans must be held in portfolio of the acquiring credit union. Thanks again, Al. Um, Matt, I have another Humda question for you that not only was uh, provided to us prior to the webcast, but we also have a number of credit unions asking the same question through the Ask a Question box. And it basically, they're basically asking, is the current Humda volume threshold for open-end lines of credit 500 annually? And will this change to 100 annually in 2020? Yes. Currently, both the volume threshold for reporting open end lines of credit and the partial exemption volume threshold is 500 open end lines of credit in each of the two preceding calendar years. The uh, 2015 HUMDA final rule set the institutional coverage volume threshold at 100 open-end lines of credit. But in 2017, the Bureau finalized a rule that temporarily increased the open-end threshold to 500 for calendar years 2018 and 2019. In doing so, the Bureau indicated that the two-year period would allow time for the Bureau to decide through an additional rulemaking whether any permanent adjustments to the opened-in threshold are needed. So it is possible that before 2020, the Bureau will make permanent the temporary volume threshold of 500 or they could make permanent a different threshold. But with no further action from the Bureau, the institutional coverage volume threshold will revert to 100 in 2020. Thank you, Matt. 
Um, some of the questions that have been submitted through the Ask a Question box involve humdas, so I'll be asking Matt to answer a few of these. Uh, the first question asks, so until our financial institution completes 30 mortgages in the prior two years, we no longer have to file humda regardless of asset size? For example, if we fund 35 mortgages this year and next, would we file humda in 2021? The, uh, the institutional coverage criteria for closed-in mortgage loans is, is set at 25. So if a credit union originates 25 closed-in mortgage loans in each of the two preceding calendar years, and they meet the other coverage criteria, such as having a uh, home or branch office in an MSA and having total assets of at least $45 million, then they are still required to file a HUMDA report. And one thing that's somewhat confusing with the discussion that we've introduced with the partial exemptions is what we talked about with the partial exemptions, that, that's separate from whether a credit union has to complete a HUMDA report. Whether a credit union has to complete a HUMDA report would be determined based on the institutional coverage criteria. Whether a credit union is exempt from reporting the 26 data points that we talked about today, that's defined by the, the uh, threshold, the, the 500 or more in the prior two calendar years threshold for both closed-in mortgages and open-in lines of credit. Thank you, Matt. Speaking about the 26 data points, um, we have another question asking, if we are partially if we are partially exempt for HUMDA, are we allowed to not report the 26 data points for all of 2018? Yes, that that is correct. So the uh, S2155 was uh, passed during the middle of the year, or actually it was passed in the in the latter half of this year, but um, it applies it applies to the entire calendar year so if uh, if a credit union qualifies for a partial exemption then that partial exemption applies to all loans and applications where action was taken in 2018 not just those that occurred after implementation of the rule Thank you, Matt. Another question has to do with filing quarterly LAR. Um, so the question asks, I may have misunderstood, but did the speaker say that financial institutions are to file LAR information quarterly? No, uh, there, there is an annual filing requirement. What the regulation requires is that LAR information that occur, occurred during a particular calendar quarter must be recorded on a LAR within 30 days after quarter end. So in effect, um, a credit union is required to be updating their LAR quarterly even though they only file once per year. Thank you, Matt. I think we have time for one more question. Um, it deals with MSAs, and the question asks, our credit union has a branch in an MSA. 
So we do not qualify for any exemptions, correct? Yes, yeah, so again, we, we have to make a distinction between institutional coverage and qualifying for a partial exemption. Um, the, the two are separate and they have different coverage criteria. The, uh, whether a credit union has a branch or home office located in an MSA is part of the criteria to determine whether or not a credit union has to file a humdalar. Um, it's, it's separate from whether they qualify for an exemption. So if a credit union has a branch in an MSA, has no bearing on whether or not they qualify for an exemption. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, again, if you have any questions you would like to ask our office, please feel free to email us at the address listed on slide 57. Uh, thank you, Joe, Matt, and Al. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. We'll talk to you credit unions again soon. Goodbye.